Today we're talking about, as you can see already written, natural selection, yep, and, and featuring, as you can see, artificial selection. Um, one of the, as I was about to say when I realized my mic was off, as I was about to say, one of the state standards is actually that you also understand artificial selection. Um, I'm going to trust that you know, in general, what the terms natural and artificial mean, and we're focusing in, really on this idea of biological selection. We will, we will talk more in detail about what each of those mean even if you don't know what the words natural and artificial mean. Um, but I want you to consider this example first as a as way of an introduction. Example. The three-toed sloth and the nine-banded armadillo look very different from each other. You, are you familiar with these critters? Let's try to draw them. That'll, that'll be a fun way to kill some time. Um, which one should I try to draw first? Oh, golly. I think I'm going to start with its little face here. I think that's pretty good so far. And and maybe it does look to some people like Santa's true. Three toed sloth. You'll see I was very detailed in my drawing to include the number of toes it has, which is three. <clears throat> that's pretty good. Pretty good three toed sloth. Now we're gonna draw a nine banded armadillo. I think I think I have a specific number of bands in mind for how many it should have. Almost like me. It's not a perfect friend. These are bands. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bands. It has nine bands, and this is the nine band. And and your book is saying they look very different from each other, but they share a common ancestor from millions of years ago. Genetic change over many generations resulted in these two species. So in order to highlight that, you can see this. there's this kind of, remember we talked last time about this, this branching nature of evolution. Evolution that is the change of organisms population over time. Evolution, well, let's redefine as the change in traits among a population over time. In fact, I would say, you remember the other the other main um, noun that we talked about last time? We talked about evolution. What was the other main noun we talked about last time? This started with an M. Mm, that meant the changes within an organism in its genetics. Mutation. We talked about the process of evolution and the process of mutation. I'm going to posit to you that they are similar. Remember, mutations can cause evolution. Um, the mutations are changes in the genetic code of a specific organism. You! Even you, a specific organism. Have you ever met a specific organism named Tristan Gillette? Mutations could occur within Tristan Gillette. In fact, they do all the time at random when the cells um, when the chromosomes divide, there's always, not always maybe, but there's usually some kind of mutation, or there may be some kind of mutation. Do you have so, a, something to add? Why wouldn't evolution be the same mutation just that the cells are changing? Just that. Just that. So the mutation is leads to evolution because, and what I'm getting at, is that this happens within the individual. Some specific organisms, perhaps maybe named Tristan Gillette, could... Uh, develop a mutation within the individual. And then over time, those changes in individuals, as they reproduce and uh, proliferate the species, cause a change in the population. So the, the main, the difference between these, there, there are lots of differences in mechanism, but the differences that we're talking about right now is that this, is, this occurs in the individual and this one occurs in a population. So we're thinking these two pictures here are pictures of individuals, but they're representing populations. Now, this is a main, a huge misconception people have. And the reason people say things like, I wasn't evolved from a monkey, is because they think that this common ancestor here, we'll call it a slothadillo. I'm going to draw it really good. Okay, this is a fictional organism, but I'm going to say... Um, obviously, the slothadillo has tentacles. Those were the mutation caused those to be lost later. Um, but this organism, 
do you, do you understand this is a joke? I've drawn an eldritch horror here as a joke. But the point is, or one of the points is, that we can't know. There's no way for us to know what this organism itself probably was. We can see, maybe we have a fossil of something that was like a proto-sloth, and a something that, of something that was like a proto-armadillo, and maybe we even have a fossil of something that was closely or similar to both of these two things. But it probably wasn't the actual actual common ancestor that caused them to diverge. That population may or may not ever have been fossilized. Um, so I've, I've kind of done a joke. Probably it didn't have tentacles, maybe. Probably it didn't have tentacles. Um, but it did have different traits from both of these. And as I was saying, this individual did not become these individuals. This population of millions of individuals, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals, over time, as it divided, how would a population divide? Yeah, right away from other yeah okay, yeah, there's some kind of separation. Um, that separation can be in either environment or in niche. Maybe some of them went to, maybe a mountain range grew up between them, and they had to evolve separately. They had to change separately. That can definitely happen. Maybe some of them um, became more specialized than others. This, this tentacle monstrosity maybe eats insects and berries, and over time, a part of the population selectively only eats berries, and those change to be more adapted to eat vegetation. I don't actually know what either of these things eat, so don't at me. Um, but, but the point of this style diagram is that the, this individual did not become these individuals. The population changes over time, and that's evolution. That's evolution. Population is changing over time. We, I've heard it defined as a change, let's spell the word change, right, at least. Change in allelic frequency over time. What is, we talked about this last time, what's an allele? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, go on. No. A change in, uh, let me remind you. It's a, okay, it's a gene that codes for a trait. In fact, it's the other way around. It's a trait that is coded for by a gene. Remember we talked about last time how you can have traits that are genetic traits, like your hair color, and you can have traits that are non-genetic traits, like your hair color. No, that's a joke. But, but most of us, for our natural hair color, that's a genetic trait. We've received our hair color in a way from our parents. But I'm, the reason I also use that as an example is that some people, no one in this room, but some people change their hair color on purpose, and that's a that's a environmental trait. You know, like if a human being dyes their hair color or their dog's hair color, whatever that that trait is no longer um, genetic. Pink hair is not a genetic trait. But a better example would have been um, I used I think an example last time of hair color versus an amputation. If you lose your arm, that is a trait you have. You've only got one arm, but it's not a genetic trait. Your children won't be born with only one arm, right? So a change in Traits that are coded for by genes, frequency over time. An example that your book uses of this is the example of lupines, uh, a kind of plant called lupines. And we have this distribution curve of lupines where most, if we go out into a field of lupines, most of the lupines will be of this kind of pinkish color. A few of them will be purplish. A few of them will be bluish. And a very few of them will be white. And they follow this neat, what's called in statistics, a normal curve. It follows this normal curve, where most of them have feature this trait, a few of them have either one of these traits, and very few have this other trait. And it doesn't have to be three traits, it could be eight traits. But these are alleles. And as this distribution curve can move over time, that's evolution. That's a population evolving. Because in order to get this distribution curve, we have to have more than one individual, right? We can't build this bar graph about what color are the lupines with one lupine. It would be a very boring bar graph, wouldn't it? We need to, we need to factor in the traits of a whole population to, to realize evolution, to notice evolution. This is called a, a, a normal distribution curve. A normal distribution let I spell distribution as distribution but you don't have to spell it that way distribution curve I'm gonna leave it though to highlight how stupid I am um, a normal distribution curve is what we have here and the change in this over time the change in the frequency of alleles what's the word frequency mean remind me yeah well how what they are how something 
yeah, how common, how often these traits show up, these genetic traits called alleles. A change in this over time is evolution. And that has to take place in a population. Evolution is over a population. So that's, this is all kind of what we talked about last time. But what drives that? What can you guess what two-word phrase drives evolution? Natural selection. Exactly. So the, the question is, why would this ever change? Why would this ever change? Why might these ever change? To yeah, to get, to get what? To get better. To survive. Um, but rem remind yourself, this is a very common misconception. They don't do these things. It's not like sloth one morning wakes up and says, I wish I was faster, and then just decides to like, start working out. Maybe he does. I don't know. But that would be an individual change. Might even be caused by a mutation. But that would be an individual change that would not necessarily impact the population. A change in populations is evolution. And so this natural selection is usually driven by environmental changes. It can be driven by mutations, but it's usually driven by environmental changes. For instance, uh-oh, climate change. You see I'm drawing climate change? The climate of this sloth, let's say, which is normally used to a, a humid, warm jungle environment, becomes more like it is outside today. You can't see it. on. The, I was going to move the camera, but it's not worth it. It's very snowy. Uh-oh, climate change, environmental change. When this sloth has a litter, assuming it doesn't die, when this sloth has a litter, which of its litter of sloths will be most likely to survive? The best one. The best one for what? The snow. The snow. So probably the furriest one. If it happens to have, maybe because of mutation, maybe just because of random chance, maybe because of, remember the other one was genetic recombination. Do you know that sloths mate with each other? I have never seen it. Um, even on a video, but I assume that it happens in a way similar to how other critters mate with each other. And that genetic recombination, I bet very slow. Probably very slow. Probably very stinky too. But the genetic recombination that occurs there has an effect. That's not a mutation, but it affects the litter. So let's say this sloth <laughs> has babies. And just because of either the genetic recombination or mutation, these babies, some of them are born relatively unfurry and some of them are born really quite fluffy. In this environment, which are more likely to survive? Yeah. So these ones probably will have a better chance of surviving. And then as these ones grow up years later, and they mate, well, probably not with each other, as they may, maybe, I don't know, the animal kingdom's weird, y'all. They don't follow the laws of Arkansas or Kentucky. Um, the, as these ones mate, as these mate, they're more likely, or they're, they're not more likely to pass that on. That's another misconception. Randomly, they might pass on their trait of furriness. And those that are born furry will be better surviving in the cold climate. And the next generation, maybe, maybe that time, they mate with another furry one. And those furry ones have only furry babies. And you can see that this allelic frequency, this is still lupines, but we could do this same normal distribution curve for furriness for our little baby sauce. And this would change over time because what changed? What changed in this case? The climate. We call this evolutionary pressure. What are some other kinds of evolutionary pressure we can think of? You should probably write some of this down. I'm surprised by how little writing is going on in here. Um, what, what, other could, what else could provide evolutionary pressure? Climate change was one example. Basically, the environment changed. And so now, the, what, what traits are needed to be adapted to the environment changed? Okay, another example. So we could have environmental evolutionary pressure. What else might change? It doesn't have to be a change even necessarily. What else might cause evolutionary pressure? Okay, uh, so, so um, let's put other organisms. Certainly humans. Predators. What else? What other kind of relationships in the ecosystem could cause this evolutionary change, this evolutionary pressure? So, yeah, other organisms. So we've got predators, um, environmental damagers. I'll put damage in quotes so it's, so it's not judgmental. Um, competitors, right? If something, uh, a marmoset starts eating all the berries, I 
think sloths eat berries. A marmoset starts eating all the berries the sloths were eating. Maybe that could cause the sloths that are born that don't need quite as much food. Those would be more adapted to the environment now. You see, and all these adaptations arrive more or less at random through either mutation or genetic recombination. Remember when they mate, that's genetic recombination. But the results are driven by natural selection. So it's not caused by natural selection. It's not caused by the environment, the evolutionary pressure. Um, it's caused by, the changes are caused by mutation and genetic recombination. But the result, whether those critters live or not, is natural selection, sometimes called survival. What? What am I going to say next? Of the fittest. And that doesn't mean the most swole and with the most six-pack and with the fastest running, Aiden. It doesn't mean those things. It might in some circumstances, but it means the ones that are most suited for their environment. Yeah? Most suited for their environment. Let me give you another example here. Oh, sorry. Let's finish our list about evolutionary pressure. What other things might cause evolutionary pressure? Can you think of it? All right. Somewhere between environmental and other organisms, probably that is. Maybe this list is good as it is, huh? Um, yeah, the but what what is what's there's kind of like a, a funneling point in the process of evolution that it's not whether these organisms live or die, it's whether they what or die. What is the what is the actual success in biology? Survive. Mating, whether they mate or die, because their genetic material does not pass on. Their alleles don't pass on if they don't reproduce. That's a success. In biology, that's also a success when you're. Um, I've never. Maybe I won't make that joke to eighth graders. Um, dating. I was gonna say something about dating. You guys were talking about Tinder the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some. Um, but you're much too young for that. The the mic probably heard that, Mason. Let's let's pretend that didn't get said. Uh, let me give you another example. Owls are birds of prey. Did you know that? Owls are birds of prey that hunt other animals for food. The great horned owl can be found in many habitats between Arctic and South America. A wide wingspan, powerful talons, and keen eyesight make these animals powerful hunters. Evolution by natural selection over many millions of years resulted in these adaptations. Remind me, what evidence might there be for the ancestors of owls or sloths or armadillos? We mentioned it once before. What is the evidence for this? Yeah, we have these, this, once again, this two-pronged approach. We can see what things were like back in time by using fossils, and we can see how things are today by, use, by looking at proxy organisms. We can say maybe this fossil was quite more like the armadillo than, than the modern sloth, and we know how modern sloths and armadillos behave because we can observe them today. So we use this two-pronged approach of taking what we've got in the present and applying it to the past, and taking the fossils from the past and applying that to how things might have been um, around that fossil. So the owl has developed these traits. Let's list some traits of an owl. Some allelic traits, some alleles, traits that are coded for by genetics, traits of an owl. No. Come on, give me some traits of an owl. We don't have all day. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Let's yeah. So their eyesight. Let's say eyesight, three sixty neck. They can three sixty no scope a mouse right out of the ground. Three sixty neck. What else? I don't think it's quite three sixty. I'll put approximately. I don't think it's quite. I think it might be two seventy. Um, it's more than one eighty, I believe. Next. What else? Okay, talons. Why are those? Hey, how? Okay, okay. Um, eyesight plus vision. I'll put that. What's, what do you remember the coolest feature of an owl? What about it though? What's about what about their what about yeah very I'm not gonna put silent but almost silent flight. Now let's talk about how each of these things would be an adaptation for the owl. How is this? Remember, an adaptation is a positive trait that helps in its environment. How is the eyesight and vision adaptation? How will that help it be reproductively successful? Subject saved other owls in the dark. 
Okay, so we can see other elements, but also we're going to see it's food, right? It won't remember, Cameron, you're getting right at the crux of reproduction, the process of me. But remember, it won't, it can't do that if it's starved to death. And so it helps it see its food better is another thing. Both of those. Helps it see its food better. Okay? What about 360 neck? It can 360. see behind it. Yeah, it can. It yeah, so it's not quite. So it can see its ops. Yeah, it can see. What, what is a good slang for, uh, for a mate? Riz. It can do the riz look. Yeah. Uh, but it can do. It can. This, this allows it to both see and hear its prey better and mates better. Good. Talons, how might that help it? Grabbing its prey. Grabbing its prey. Good. What about its almost silent flight? So it can sneak up on them. So it can sneak up on them, little fellows. Yeah. Good. And so these traits all are adapted for its not only its environment, but its niche for its job, which is capture little critters out from the ground. And so these are all adaptations for its niche. Now, is it possible that in a what a small group of, like a group of baby owlets called a baby owl is called an owlet. Um, well, in its little nest, would it be possible for one of these? Let's say one is born, one is born with smaller talons, right? So maybe instead of these are our normal distribution, maybe these are all medium talons, these are all large talons, and these are all small talons, and these are all extra small talons. And let's say it, over the course of a hundred nests, we come up with this distribution curve. Most of them have medium talons, a few of them have large or small, and very few have extra small talons. Okay, so we've got our normal distribution curve again. Which of these do you think is most likely to succeed and therefore reproduce? Medium talons. Yeah, well, okay, so we're saying medium. Why? What, what might be true of the large ones? There's two things, there are two drawbacks. Okay, it might get in the way, it might have some physical difficulty with it, it might kill their mate, it's not Riz. Right, the 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 the, op, the owl of the opposite sex engaged in reproduction might say, "I don't like your big talons." No, but that that's just a joke. But but furthermore, they're getting they're, you're missing a major point that is often true in evolution. There's this idea of an energy trade-off. The, the talons don't come from nothing, right? We often, since our food is so abundant, we think of growth as just like a given. But in the wild, it takes more food to turn into large talons than it does to turn into medium talons. So in a way, the large talons actually made it, make it harder to survive at some point. Do you see what I mean? It also, they're heavier. They make it harder to fly. And so this probably is not going to be selected for. However, if the environment changes, and now all, let's say, the environment drastically changes, all the mice die, and all it can hunt for are rabbits. Now, how do you think this curve is going to shift? There's going to be a, a tendency towards larger talons. Now, is it... Is it, now here's the major misconception, this will be the last thing before we go. Is it that the owl says, oof, all these rabbits, I gotta start having babies with bigger talons. Is this a, is this a, is this a effort, is natural selection working that way, that more babies are born now with larger talons? No, but the ones with larger talons survive after they're born. Whether they have larger, medium, or smaller, extra small talons is still, either a mutation or from genetic recombination, and therefore mostly random. But whether it lives or not is not random. It's survival of the fittest. And since the environment has changed, fit has changed. The fit has changed. Bye!